Um, okay, so good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be with you here today, even though we're on Zoom, well, not in person. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for organizing this very important conference. Um, okay, so diversity is a growing imperative in the US, in Canada, as well as in other parts of the world. And we increasingly understand time and again how important it is to allow all voices to be heard, all talents to participate in the country's education, economy and leadership. We definitely understand it very well in Israel today. And diversity management is indeed a flourishing industry with a growing number of consultants and training and book writers and DEI innovations that travel across industries, sectors and countries, often with no reflection about their effect. And indeed, so far, management is, uh, diversity management has very little to show for in terms of changing the demographics of leadership jobs and good jobs in US uh, economy and universities. So, okay, this data, did the slide move now, change? Are we good? Yep, we're good. Oh, okay, I just have two screens here, so I wasn't sure. So this data that you see in front of you uh, show the proportion of women and minorities who are managers in mid-sized and large US companies. You see that the lines for all groups are pretty flat, exclude, excluding for Asians, but they are far, low, far lower than is, than is expected, given that they are the most educated group in the US. 51% of all Asian Americans have a college degree. So, um, so the numbers should, should be higher. The lines for Latinx and Blacks didn't change much since the 1980s. 6% of black men and 7% of Latinx men were managers in 2018, the same as in the 1980s. Black and Latina women uh, did move up, but very, very slowly. By 2018, about 5% of black women uh, workers and 6% of uh, Latina women workers were managers, up from 4% in early 1980s. At this rate, it will take two centuries for black women to catch up with white men and one century for um, Latinx women to catch up. At the end of the day, then, there are lots of diversity programs, lots of diversity discourse and almost no change in the leadership of US corporations. And it is not surprising, given that most popular programs are the ineffective ones. Why did that happen? Well, we took the wrong approach. We've been mainly trying to fix biased managers, and that hasn't worked, as, as you can see in front of you. But it can work if we try to fix biased systems. And it's not because biased managers are not part of the problem. It's just that the way we've tried, we have been trying to fix them doesn't work as a solution. And fixing biased systems may sound like proposing a radical revision of corporate or university structures and processes. But what we find as effective require, as I will show you, for the most part, very light adjustments to processes that are already existing. Okay, so my talk today diversity. I showed it to you earlier and you saw it on the first slide. Um, the book takes an evidence-based approach to diversity management. It uses in-depth data from a total of almost 1,000 companies over the last four decades to understand what works in increasing diversity and what doesn't work and why. I will share with you today principles for effectively opening career opportunities, opportunities to shine, to thrive, to progress, to leadership jobs, and illustrate them on some of the programs that we cover in the book but they can be used in devising other programs as well. The patterns will be very clear about what kinds of things work and what kinds of thing, things backfire. And that is what I'm hoping you'll take home with you. We are now, um, although I will, be, I will report results from, from the book, we are now in the midst of analyzing parallel, parallel data on US universities and colleges 
which we have recently collected. The results I will share today are replicated in those data. I even think I inserted a couple of slides here from the university um, analysis to illustrate that. Okay, so first we'll start with fixing biased managers. So the typical company starts its diversity campaign with diversity training that introduces managers to their biases and to the unlawful outcomes of their biased decisions. This and sexual harassment training are probably the most common measures employers take in an attempt to reduce inequality or at least signal that they are making the effort. Both kinds of training, trainings emphasize managers' biases. Diversity training comes to address explicit and implicit biases that affect the evaluation of women, Blacks, Hispanics, workers with disabilities, and other minoritized groups um, in, in decisions about recruitment and promotions, as well as in everyday interactions at work. In addition to biases, training usually also covers the legal requirements uh, related to non-discrimination. And, uh, and the legal definition of harassment and, and, and requirements. Diversity trainings often discusses also the idea of um, multiculturalism and the business case for diversity and inclusion. But studies repeatedly, dozens and hundreds of studies, repeatedly show that these trainings are not effective. Now, we know that managerial bias is part of the causes uh, of inequality. What is the problem then with programs that try to, to put this on the table to, to teach managers about their biases? Well, first, biases are hardwired. They have been embedded in us during the... Uh, sorry. Okay, so biases are hardwired. They have been embedded in us during the life course uh, through countless implicit and explicit messages, starting with what we uh, get to wear as babies and as kids, uh, continuing in the media, TV, movies. Um, most of our, the popular messages that we uh, receive around us are, are stereotypes, stereotyped about gender, about race, about ability, about age. No single diversity session was found to reduce this very hardwired biases or change attitudes in, a, in the long term, right? Usually diversity training programs last between one afternoon to, in the very rare cases, two days, in the very rare cases, more than that. This is not uh, enough time to rewire our brains. Second, most trainings are mandatory, sending a message of control to participants. And this can trigger reactance. Reactance is the need to maintain psychological autonomy and also backlash against the training's goals. Okay, when we are forced to sit in the room to listen to something, and especially something that blames us that, uh, about our biases, uh, we were very likely um, to act in, in reactance in this kind of backlash. So for example, one, um, one laboratory study found that when subjects were pressured to write a pro-Black essay. They complied, they wrote good essays, but they also experienced high levels of uh, anger, threat, and resentment, which then resulted in backlash against the pro-Black diversity policy, which was discussed after they were running the, writing the essay. In another study, when researchers showed anti-prejudice material to subjects, Prejudice declined, and, uh, sorry, prejudice declined among those that were primed to think that they chose the goal of reducing prejudice, but it increased among those primed to think that the goal was imposed on them. So these are real negative consequences that diversity training can have on people's attitudes and feelings uh, toward diversity and internalization of goals. Also, sociological research on job autonomy shows similar patterns. People resist controls regulating their work and they act to undermine and sabotage management goals. So what we have here is a case that the most common type of diversity training, mandatory training, which um, is 
um, common in more than 80% of, of the cases, sends a message that is likely to lead to backlash and not to internalization of goals. Third, and yet uh, other studies show that diversity training and the requirement to suppress uh, our, our categories in favor of colorblindness actually makes categor categories more variable and activates bias. There are additional reasons uh, for, for, for why diversity training doesn't work, um, but I, I, I will um, keep it at that and show you uh, the effects of um, adopting ongoing diversity training programs um, on the, the management uh, diversity, on the diversity of management positions in the companies that adopted these programs. So, Basically, this is what happens after a company introduces a typical diversity training. We call this, um, it, it, this is a mandatory legalistic training, uh, which is in about 75% or 80% of the cases, depending how you count them. These bars represent the average change in group share among managers in the years following program adoption Usually we're talking about an average of five to seven years and all the slides that I'll show next will have similar structure of these bars. And you see the line, uh, the zero line and all the bars go below the zero line basically means that after the introduction, in the years after the introduction of um, this training, we see decline in the share of different groups in management. Uh, in management. These are uh, results of an analysis that follows companies over time. So it compares how many, uh, for example, black men they had in management before and after program adoption. And the analysis takes into account other characteristics of the company, of the program, of the workforce, and so forth. So what you see here is a serious backlash. This is actually worse than a waste of time. We can see that thought control is not a productive way to reduce bias. And in fact, it seems like it creates a chillier environment for um, women and people of color. Um, these are results, ah, okay, sorry. These are results for faculty diversity training. I, I, I thought I integrated a couple of slides and indeed I did. Uh, so we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're replicating now the research that we did on corporations uh, to universities. And this is what happens when you try the same exercise of thought control uh, through diversity training um, in, in faculty um, settings. When you're trying to increase the diversity of your faculty, indeed, diversity training doesn't seem to be uh, the way. Uh, and again, it shows negative um, results. When it comes to harassment training, we see similar patterns. And this is not surprising. Harassment training is mandatory. The same, uh, uh, it's, it's very legalistic. Very, uh, uh, it, it sends the same messages to uh, participants. In fact, laboratory research shows that men that score high on likely harasser and gender role conflict scales frequently also have adverse reactions to harassment training. So this, they score higher on these scales after harassment training. So harassment training or anti-harassment training may do more harm than good because it antagonizes the very men and tra the trainers hope to reform. Uh, I wanted to bring some good news here. Uh, so here we looked at harassment training for managers that emphasizes bystander training. So it's not about blaming, but it's about giving tools, giving managers tools to intervene if they see harassment. And that seems to be uh, more effective. The effects are not negative. In fact, they are positive, although they are quite small. Um, these specific programs that we examined here were not designed solely to be bystander training. So they were mixed legalistic blaming and bystander if the content would be if the content is purely bystander we expect to see these results even more positive um, and field research uh, on, it, on on this type of uh, training um, suggests that it, it it increases the 
the manager's intention to intervene, their confidence about a ability to intervene and um, an ability to reduce sexual harassment. So managers in bystander training uh, feel like agents of change rather than um, feel um, anger for being blamed or victimized and so forth. Um, okay, so going back to the typical diversity campaign, uh, I mentioned diversity training and uh, sexual harassment training as the first go-to solutions that companies uh, adopt. Um, but beside, beside this training, companies usually put in place rules trying to reduce managers' discretion in decision-making. Decision For example, formal uh, performance evaluations or skill tests. The goal is to make managers rely on data rather than on bias in, in decision making. The outcome is not so much reduced bias. Here is what happens uh, when companies adopt skill tests. Uh, these are um, this provide one good example for management uh, managers resistance uh, to to attempts to control their decisions. So companies introduce skill tests with the goal uh, of uh, forcing managers to hire or promote workers that score best on some objective tests. But managers resist these um, controls. They hire their friends, those that they feel most comfortable with, without giving them the, the test, or they give the test to everyone, but they ignore some of the results or they interpret tests um, interpret results, sorry, as they see fit. Uh, for example, in her ethnographic study of hiring to big law or uh, and financial consulting firms, Lauren Rivera found that when white men blew a math exam, interviewers concluded that they just had a bad day. When blacks or women candidates did the same thing, scored the same on the math exam, it was con concluded that they are just not good at math. So we discount positive data on candidates that we don't believe in, and we disregard negative information on candidates that we believe in. So if the candidate that we don't believe in had a good score, we would say that she was lucky. We would not think that she's simply good. These dynamics are probably familiar in academic uh, job markets and promotions as well. In job talks, when our favorite candidate blows the Q&A, we say, oh, he was nervous. And when it happens to another candidate that we actually don't trust or we, they are not our favorite, we would say, oh, they're shallow, they cannot think on their feet and so on. Whoever knows the Rooney rule, um, from the American Football League. That's a very popular example now. Uh, the Rooney Rule, um, basically it's named after the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, owner. Uh, it requires interviewing at least one black candidate when there is um, a head coach vacancy. In practice, it became a check the box practice uh, while the real problem it wasn't solved. So even though the rule uh, the role was hoping to uh, increase uh, hiring of black uh, coaches because uh, it, through this requirement, um, this kind of control was easily circumvented by, um, by, by, uh, by interviewers, by those that need to hire the coaches. At the end of the day, introducing skill tests have made uh, things worse as they were they are used to legitimize ex exclusion. Similarly, perfor performance evaluations um, also show negative effects, uh, smaller, but they're, they're not positive. Um, another popular part of equity and diversity management is to sanction managers for discrimination. Discrimination and harassment grievance procedures are extremely popular in corporations, in universities, in the public sector, you name it. They offer mechanisms for workers to complain and, if need be, to punish discriminators and harassers. Uh, but women and other minorities groups often distrust grievance procedures and rarely file complaints. And they're right. 
Formal complaints rarely lead to the transfer or removal of the harasser or to punishing the discriminator, but they do lead to retaliation. In about 66% of the cases, according to one survey of federal workers, and more than that, according to other data sources, the complainant often remains isolated in, in search for that justice. Their co-workers are afraid to corroborate their stories. HR uh, may even say, I know the guy's a jerk, but just leave me out of it, as the excellent work of Ellen Berry and Laura Beth Nielsen and Bob Nelson has shown. Complaining often puts workers through hell, studying, for example, comparing women that a file com filed complaints to women that were harassed but didn't file complaints, uh, show worse career, mental health, physical health, uh, and other outcomes, worse outcomes for those who were harassed but didn't file complaints. So filing a complaint make, uh, makes the event even worse uh, with worse consequ consequences for the victim. Now, the irony is that when the CEO sees that no one files a complaint, they take that as a sign for non-discrimination. We're good, nobody, nobody files a complaint. Uh, the greater irony is that when there are complaints, the CEO calls for an emergency diversity training. So not surprisingly, as you see, whoops, not surprisingly, as you see, uh, grievance procedures have this very, very negative effect on the share of uh, different groups, different uh, minoritized groups in management. Uh, this is due to the retaliation, the chilly environment, and so forth. Okay, so maybe enough with bad news and we can move to some good news. In contrast to targeting individual biases and trying to teach them and to punish them, which are all good ideas, but you see, they just don't work. Uh, basically, um, because of our cognitive structures, because they, uh, the playing field is not level. So in contrast to this, a, innovations, some diversity innovations target structural bias. Now, executives mostly think that their career systems are meritocratic. They perceive inequality and lack of diversity as product of bad apples, biased managers, not of biased processes. Career processes are usually highly formalized and we tend to believe that formalization is non-discriminatory. But the average career system blocks certain groups at every stage, hiring, mentoring, training, and even layoffs. One good, good example is recruitment. Women and people of color or other minoritized groups are often, are often disadvantaged in hiring because they don't go to the right schools, those that generate the pipeline usually. When companies keep recruiting from the same three or four Ivy League schools, the recruitment pool will mirror the demographics uh, of these schools and the demographics of the company, which is mostly white. This is true. Um, this is true, obviously, more broadly, if companies continue to recruit as they have done before, they will likely get the same candidate from the same demographic groups. They need to cast a wider net. In targeted recruitment, companies send managers to recruit in colleges, uh, in communities or associations that serve underrepresented groups, such as historically black colleges, Hispanic serving institutions or associations like the Black Engineers Association or the New York uh, Hispanic Lawyer Association. Um, and see, look, look what happens when companies do that. We see significant increases in diversity. Okay, white women rise here by uh, a little bit more than 5%. So in the average company, it will be uh, from 30 to 32%. For black women, it will be from 35 to 3.9%, solely due to the adoption of this targeted recruitment that casts a wider net. From our qualitative interviews, we have learned that effective uh, targeted recruitment programs are those that send line managers, not only HR managers on recruitment trips. The idea is to send those that will eventually do the hiring 
out there to meet people, uh, to meet candidates from other groups. What happens is that these recruitment efforts not only diversify the, the, the candidate pool, but they also engage managers as leaders of these changes. And this creates buy-in. In, in general, according to cognitive dissonance and self-perception theory, involving people in leading change moves their attitude towards support of that change and leads to internalization of goals. More importantly, maybe, um, research on intergroup contact suggests that bringing diverse groups together to spend time together, uh, to collaborate, to talk about work, can reduce prejudice, prejudice and weaken stereotype. For some of the line managers that we interviewed, these trips were eye-opening experiences. Uh, it's be because in the outside society, uh, some groups are often very segregated. For example, a blacks in the US, I can say about Israel, Palestinians are very segregated from Jews. Uh, and because our organizations and universities are not diverse, oftentimes such a rec targeted recruitment trip can be the first time a line manager, faculty member a, speaks business with a representative of a minority or minoritized group. Further, furthermore, sending line managers uh, to these trips also create a commitment to these candidates if they are hired. So, when someone that the line manager interviewed on a recruitment trip gets hired, they feel committed to that person's success. That new hire then already has a mentor because of that sense of commitment. So, and we see indeed that this. Um, plays a significant role in increasing the uh, diversity of, of management positions. Incentive-based um, referrals do the same thing. When everyone, not only managers, are encouraged to, to recommend their friends, their people in their network to higher level jobs, we see long-lasting increases in diversity. So yes, this is um, incentive referral programs we see similar uh, positive effects. But I want to move to mentoring. Uh, mentoring is another good example of structural bias and an effective solution. So we know that everyone needs a mentor uh, to teach them the ropes, to give them uh, advice, to recommend them for uh, management training or to point them to new opportunities. Now, some studies show that informal mentoring uh, informal mentoring can achieve these goals, but a major drawback of informal mentoring programs is that women and minorities and other minoritized groups often have a harder time finding a mentor in informal settings. Therefore, they are often socially isolated among their peers and have no one from their own group among their managers. Informal relations of the sort that arise from a Saturday morning basketball game uh, with the guys uh, are less likely to happen to the only black woman in the finance department, for example. And so this is a classic case of structural bias in access to career opportunities. It is, it's not about direct discrimination of, by anyone, but it is a structural bias that is caused by other sources of discrimination and inequalities. Uh, that formal mentoring programs can fix. As you see, formal mentoring programs uh, address this disadvantage by expanding the access to mentors to everyone. Effective programs are open to all workers, not only those that are already viewed as management material or stars, and effective programs are also those that match by interest and not by group. Uh, as you see in the slide, mentoring programs clearly reduce the structural bias. They um, are also, by the way, very likely to reduce the con cognitive bias because of the contact, the, in the, the intergroup collaborative contact that they create, uh, which um, reduces stereotypes and increases engagement. Um, other, by the way, um, if we uh, if we look at formal mentoring programs in industries where the um, 
the core job, the promotable job uh, is of workers with um, um, academic education. So there's a skilled workers, we'll see broader effects. I think I have it in the next slide. Yes, so this is, these are the results for mentoring in science-based um, industries. And this is a slide from universities, from the university research to show the similarities between the effects. So these are the effects of formal mentoring uh, programs in universities. Here, these results refer to mentoring programs that are happening in departments. Mentoring programs in universities that are managed by the university are not effective. These are programs that are managed by departments and they are effective, as you see. Uh, and uh, they are more effective when uh, there is someone in charge. So we looked at whether there is a mentoring program, whether there is someone in charge and whether mentors actually undergo training and all these things. But the, the more the training, the mentoring program is managed, the more effective it is. Okay, cross training is another way to get managers involved, interacting with uh, people from uh, minority groups. Um, basically, train, cross training programs uh, offer workers the opportunity to train in other skills and other positions around the organization. It could be a rotation of uh, half days, a week, sometimes even six months. The idea, uh, the idea didn't come from uh, the EDI world. This is not a diversity. This is not a diversity program uh, in in a region, but uh, EDI managers have definitely noticed that minority workers for minority groups have better chances to get to management after they go through cross training, and this is because these trainings um, get them out of their silos. Uh, usually work is very segregated through this training they learn new skills from around the organization but they also increase their networks and their visibility same for cross-functional work teams um, and by increasing their network and their visibility we see also increasing opportunities to reach management jobs another source of structural bias is the work-life interface Work-life balance is usually perceived as a women's issue and a barrier to gender equality. But the fact is that everyone needs work-life balance and um, especially workers for minoritized groups. And another fact is that in most companies, even when work-life balance are provided, uh, uh, sorry, even when work-life supports exist in as formal policies, they are provided only informally and only to inner circle few. Um, they are rarely provided widely. So what we have is this anomaly that 80% of the companies say that they um, provide work-life supports and 80% of the workers say that they don't have enough work-life supports and they need more. And this is because companies really um, keep these supports on the DL very uh, stingy about uh, providing them. But work-life balance is actually a an important diversity um, initiative. Work-life balance is, a, oh sorry, work-life support is an important diversity initiative because work-life balance is especially difficult for workers from discriminated groups. And this is for two reasons. First, workers from discriminated groups usually need to work harder to prove their talent, to impress their managers, their bosses, to overcome biases. Even after they were hired or promoted, they're always suspect that they're not good enough, that they are here because of EDI efforts, that they were lucky. They always need to uh, impress and prove themselves. And this means that they need to show more commitment to work than the average worker. They, they need to, to stay um, longer, to to say yes to every project, to come in over the weekend if they were asked. And every, all, all these things really make work-life balance ever more difficult. Second, they are less likely to receive informal accommodations. 
So a top manager, a friend of the VP, is more likely to get um, schedule flexibility when they have new twins than a Hispanic, a Hispanic woman working in the mailroom, for example, or the, the black guy at the pizza counter, right? So the work-life interface poses another structural a barrier for diversity. Work-life supports can help workers from disadvantaged groups to keep their jobs, to thrive in their jobs, rather than being forced to quit due to work-life uh, conflict. So let's see um, some of the uh, some of the work-life supports that we looked at. We really looked at um, work-life supports that are very minimal, and you can see. For example, this is flex time policy. Um, so when organization, a, a flex time policy is basically a policy of moving the, a little bit the starting hours and the ending hours around the core set of hours where everybody has to be at the office or at work. So this is really not a radical change and see how much it increases across the board the, the odds of uh, workers from minoritized groups to get into management. Now, for these effects to happen, employers and managers really need to be committed to providing work-life supports to everyone who needs it. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, this has not been the status quo, but COVID, for example, COVID-19 showed us that it's possible to provide flexibility and it even increases um, productivity. These are um, parental leave policies, and here I'm referring not even to paid leaves. We didn't have enough paid leaves in the sample. So here we're looking at simply a policy with, uh, that makes the basic legal uh, requirement known and the procedures to, um, to apply to the to a maternity leave or parental leave known uh, to workers and see how it increases uh, diversity. The idea here that there is a law in the, in the US, uh, the Family and Medical Leave Act from since 1993 allows workers to take up to 12 weeks unpaid. That's the worst law in the world, I think. Uh, but even though, but, but workers don't even know about this law and not, don't even know about the uh, rights once the, the company advertises their rights and make sure make sure everybody knows their rights and how to apply for this uh, leave. It does it, it does two things. First, it, it provides the information, and second, it signals that the company believes in work life supports. The company understands that workers have families and that they need help and accommodation. A, to, to balance the work uh, and the family. Childcare referrals, same. These are online lists of local childcare centers. Sometimes um, uh, they're updated with availability and obviously um, these are lists of licensed uh, care providers. The cost for this list is almost nothing, but it sends again the signal that the company wants to help with childcare and that you can ask your supervisor for help uh, or for flexibility when you need childcare uh, or, when, or when your childcare falls through. Again, you see this very nice cross the board effects, not only on women of uh, providing childcare referral programs, and these are childcare vouchers. Uh, they're also, uh, these have positive effects mainly on women, and they're also childcare a centers that companies offer. I don't have the slide for that here. Uh, these are a little bit more expensive options. As you see, they are uh, very effective. I want to go back to flex time for a second. Uh, there is a lot of work now showing how companies can be creative with, with flex time. Um, one of the important things, and the book really um, gives a lot of attention to that because uh, flexibility is one of the things that companies are really worried about, uh, worried about providing. Uh, similarly, in universities, uh, I mean, we cannot talk about flex time in universities, but uh, we can talk about alternative career models and uh, tenure clock extensions and so forth. Um, these are kind of uh, breaks from the ideal worker model and managers uh, often 
uh, equate breaking from the ideal worker model of a 24 7 committed uh, worker a break from that uh, is a break from productivity which is uh, empirically not true in fact research shows that and workers that um, have more flexibility are also more productive. Um, in one study by uh, The Gap, the, the retailer, um, the clothes retailer, Gap, uh, showed that very nicely. They um, wanted to increase schedule control, which is the flip side of uh, uh, schedule flexibility. They wanted to increase the schedule control of their um, retail frontline workers. So they did an experiment that lasted nine months where they gave them a two week notice for their uh, about their shifts. They allowed them to swap shifts. Before that, they didn't allow them to swap shift, shifts, which is quite radical. And they also reduced uh, on call, uh, their on call to reduce to minimum uh, the emergency shifts. And what they discovered after nine months is that workers just reported there that they are a little bit uh, happier, that they, it's easy, a little bit easier for them to balance their work life, that productivity rose by seven percent and sales rose by five percent, only by introducing these very simple solutions. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the book. Um, has many more examples and principles for um, how to implement flexibility. The last principle that we need to think about when we think about a effective management program, effective diversity management programs, uh, is to put managers in charge of designing, implementing, and leading change. This doesn't only increase buying, as we discussed earlier, it also promises that diversity innovations will fix, will, 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 will fix the structural biases of your specific organization, department, university, location, and fit your specific diversity needs, um, which is way better than just taking an off-the-shelf program, obviously. Diversity task forces are a good example. And there are another uh, examples of innovations that address structural bias. Diversity task forces or committees are composed of managers from different departments, not only diversity or HR staff, but line managers or faculty, if we are discussing universities, uh, from different departments and different, different ranks. Um, ideally, you would have a VP level there or a dean. They engage in self-study of, uh, of sources of bias. Um, again, rather than implementing um, off-the-shelf solutions that might not be relevant, sim simply not relevant to the history and the culture and the, and the need of, of your workplace. Uh, they tailor solutions, they implement them, they study change, they use focus groups and cultural surveys. As they do that, while they do that, they also um, create engagement and buying and commitment to the goals of the task force and then to the goals of diversity and this is what happens when line managers sit on task force Whoop, it's this one sorry uh, you see that uh, there are vast and large increases in diversity in a, most companies that we interviewed like in fedex and another bush and um, in other companies uh, there are several task forces related to different groups because each uh, minoritized group has its own barriers and needs and these task forces meet uh, with the with the VP and the CEO every three months to report what uh, are they doing, how is it going, uh, what are the new um, tasks that they have, the programs that they have, uh, and so forth. This reporting creates this kind of social accountability that uh, increases the effectiveness of, um, of these task forces. Another source of uh, social accountability is um, uh, goals, basically setting goals and looking at numbers. Uh, managers are used to numbers in any a 
area of management beside a besides diversity. So managers are used to sales target and cost cutting uh, targets and growth targets. They need targets. We work with targets all the time. Can you imagine telling your salesperson, I don't think targets are right here, but that's the answer when we talk about targets in uh, diversity, diversity targets. Numbers create awareness and create accountability, and uh, we cannot work, we cannot really create long-term processes without this awareness and accountability. We need to look at numbers. According to accountability theory, decision makers uh, use more cognitive resources when they believe they will be asked to explain their decisions, when they believe they will um, face um, some kind of accountability. And I'm not talking about punishment, I'm talking about uh, explaining your decisions, uh, reporting, presenting in a, in a conference, your, the, the task force activities and so forth. Uh, it's not about having the right answers. It is about anticipating the need to explain uh, and to, to, to share what you did. So for example, in the laboratory studies, um, sorry, a laboratory study uh, shows that when respondents uh, were notified that they may be asked to explain their decisions after choosing a more uh, candidate, the decisions that they made were less gender biased compared to those responded that uh, were in the control group. They, uh, they were not notified that they may need to explain their decisions. Awareness um, uh, also, sorry, accountability also create awareness. Oftentimes we're just not aware of the numbers, we're not aware of the lack of diversity. And as you see here, looking at the numbers uh, is, very, is a very effective way to increase diversity. I should say that in the US, I'm less a knowledgeable about Canada. In the US, big firms like um, Facebook, a Google, Microsoft, Target, a big leading firms have began to put their um, numbers on the web in order to create this accountability transparent to the public. At this point, the numbers are mostly too vague or in wide categories like women, the, the percent of women in the workforce, while we obviously want the percent of women from different uh, groups in different jobs. Still, um, it, we, we know from our research that companies that look at numbers, although they never meet those numbers, so these are not targets, but, uh, but um, they, 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 they don't act as quotas. Um, but they constantly improve their uh, diversity because they look at the numbers. Okay. Uh, the faculty equivalent to creating this social accountability and awareness of numbers, uh, one way, uh, one equivalent is uh, faculty equity reviews. These are reviews that look at starting packages, packages uh, teaching loads, uh, service loads uh, across demographic groups. And you see again that looking at the numbers and being aware of them create a, this positive effect through social accountability and through awareness. Okay, so these are the things I would be happy if you took home. Don't bet on anti-bias strategies open career systems to all, normalize your work-life support, and put managers in charge uh, on baking in change. Change, yes. Uh, that's it, I think, yes. Thank you very much. The, the book has many more practices and examples. Now I need to stop sharing. Thank you so much. Well, can you all see me and hear me? Oh, perhaps if you stop sharing your slides. Yes. Thank you so much, Sandra, for this very broad, but very empirically rich overview of what works and what doesn't work. There's a lot of interesting, uh, challenging, difficult questions from the audience that we're going to get to. Uh, if I may, I'd love to begin with, with a question of your own. Um, I was struck with all the, all the rich work you presented on uh, EDI initiatives that tend to backfire. And it reminded me of something from my, my own field, which is uh, mental health research and in health research generally, the, the question of iatrogenesis, right? The question of uh, those diseases that may be caused by medicine or 
you know, complex situations where sometimes uh, the cure is, is part of the problem. So you very, you know, eloquently showed us how um, it, it may very well be that in, in some context, just coming into an anti-harassment or an EDI initiative makes people quite defensive. Uh, it makes people assume a perhaps unwanted position of, of an aggressor that they didn't realize they were. Um, but I was curious about um, other people who may also be uh, perhaps rightly or, or inadvertently encouraged to consider themselves to be victims. So people who perhaps are not from majority groups and people who as a result of, of diversity training uh, may come to interpret or encode say everyday forms of conflict as aggression or as racialized aggression, when perhaps that's not the, uh, the, the key variable. So I'm thinking again of some uh, mental health literacy campaigns that may have backfired also, depending on how you interpret the data, because uh, like the Beyond Blue campaign in Australia, for example, created just an explosion of people reporting to have mental health issues. And it may also be that they were encouraged to interpret the ups and downs of everyday life through the lens of a very reductionistic kind of psychopathology. So I wonder if, if your work or if you're aware of some work that has looked at, at the impact of people uh, and perhaps even potential false positives in people who are encouraged to think of themselves as victims of harassment in contexts that you know, previously would not have been deemed to be harassment. Yeah, uh, that's not what anything shows. I mean, any, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point. And uh, I, uh, I struggle on the mental health issues. I struggle, you know, I always against giving titles to things because then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm. Um, there is nothing that I know of in the qualitative research on the diversity training, increasing uh, the, 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 the false, uh, false reporting. We know that after a harassment training, for example, men are less likely to believe to reports, maybe because of what you say. That, I mean, it is interesting. Maybe men think, oh, okay, now they, they, uh, women are oversensitized and then uh, we, uh, we, we should even less believe them. But men are more likely to blame the victim after harassment training. So even if we saw that, uh, if, even if we saw more reports because, oh, now I understand that this guy was, you know, doing something wrong. Um, if I report it, I'm even less likely to, you know, succeed and improve my situation. So that would, that also counts as a kind of backlash, right? Because you want diversity or harassment training to um, maybe to increase reports and to increase um, the, the handling, the positive handling of these reports rather than the backlash, backlashing handling. Um, yeah, so with harassment, I'm more sure to say, I'm more confident saying that um, even if it does increase reporting, it also increases backlash. Is diversity training? I, I'm not sure, I just don't know of any such uh, evidence even though it's possible. Are you, are you aware of evidence that after uh, anti-harassment and EDI training, uh, the, com the complaints rise? There, there, there are more complaints as a result of people receiving the training? That was a question? Uh, so, yes, yes. Just as, as, as a follow-up question, because as a sort of just, you know, observational uh, evidence seems to suggest that, that, uh, that, that complaints are on the rise. So people who report being harassed, people who report being oppressed uh, in, in universities, for example. Is that After the training? Yeah, well, again, so if they do, uh, that would be a good outcome of the, tra of the, uh, of the training in, 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 the case, in, in the sense that it increased people's awareness of their rights. But uh, what happens is that the complaints later initiate the grievance procedure system and that system itself is discriminatory, rigged, uh, and as you see, leads to negative results. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so, so that route, unfortunately, is also derailing us. Mm -hmm. that, that cure is also part of the problem. It may be. So there's a series of, of interesting questions uh, that I can summarize as 
basically being about the, the construct of, uh, of diversity in, in, in EDI, and this speaks to some points that were, some of these questions that were raised by, by our first speaker, um, by, by some accounts, it's never quite clear what we mean by diversity, what kind uh, of diversity, um, and also what the goals of, of uh, you know, diversity in the workplace um, may be. So I know looking at your slides, you have a set of uh, gendered and, and ethnocultural variables. Um, and I wonder if you, if you could speak to that again, like how you understand first the construct of diversity, what it is, what it entails, is it ethnocultural, is it gendered? Is it also, does it also entail diversity of opinions, for example, or diversity of even political positions as you know, some of our colleagues uh, have pointed to a, a, a lack of diversity in universities in terms of, of political orientations. Um, and, and if you could also speak perhaps to what you see as, as, as the benefits of this kind of, uh, of diversity. Uh, one question, for example, asked, so is the goal just diversity itself for its own sake? Uh, is it known or is it expected to uh, increase uh, uh, well-being, increase productivity? Um, so yeah, what is it? Uh, what's the goal? What's good about it? So, well, diversity, you know, that term is, um was was uh, popularized in the 1980s um that they it's it's the more contemporary if you will uh, version of basically anti-discrimination and equal employment opportunity and affirmative action in 1964 1961 1964 65 uh, different uh, regulations on this in this regard have passed in the us uh, federal regulations and um, a lot of money was poured and, and resources into enforcement of this regulation. Uh, re regulations the, 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 through the establishment of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and through um, large uh, court cases and, and, and through just money to enforcement for enforcement. Um, in the 1980s, as Reagan came into power uh, on, the, on the platform of small government, right? So uh, corporations realized that there is not going to be enforcement for equal employment opportunity anymore and started um, uh, reducing their equal employment or compliance staff, right? So the equal employment opportunity manager was sent home as well, that was the affirmative action officer. And this is where the discourse on diversity started to uh, emerge. Uh, that it's like the, the, the secular, the non-legalized version of uh, anti-discrimination and equal opportunity. So one thing that diversity means is actually non-discrimination. Okay, so if you discriminate someone on the basis of categories that are not related to their job performance, uh, you have a problem. And if you do that systematically, you have a problem with diversity, and that's related uh, to their political uh, views as well, as much as to their gender, race, ability, age sexual orientation and so forth, religion, right? Uh, so, so, uh, so that's diversity, it's, 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 uh, it's the opposite of illegal discrimination. A diversity of opinions is also very good to have, obviously, for creativity. Uh, usually there is a correlation between lack of diversity of opinions and lack of diversity of political um, views and lack of other diversity um, that is more, you know, a, cemented within legal categories. Uh, the reason why this, uh, the data that I showed looked at very specific groups is that these are the groups that we have data for. We unfortunately don't have data on disability, age and so forth, but these are not less important or religion, you know, uh, these are not less important categories. Uh, and if you think about it more widely, you, you, from, the, from the company or university, from the organization side, uh, allowing for diversity is basically having open career opportunities. You basically having career opportunities that don't target themselves to a single group, being, you know, white men, blue people, whatever you want, right? So we want to make sure that all talents out there have the chance to rise. You can you can define diversity like that too. Okay, uh, are we are we channeled? We don't want to be channeled. Uh, what is diversity good for? For many things. Um, it's, it's um, yeah, it is good to, it, it, it often comes with diversity of experiences, doesn't have to be, because sometimes, you know, you, 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 you went to Harvard with the black guy, and, you know, sometimes the class, for example, create a resemblance that diversity um, is supposed to 
uh, is supposed to counter. Uh, so diversity could create differences in opinions, uh, differences uh, uh, in ideas and creativity. So diversity could be good for business. It could be also good for business when you want to reach certain groups in universities. Certainly, there is a lot of research showing that um, students from minoritized groups have better chances of finishing their degree if they have diverse faculty. Unfortunately, it's because diverse faculty mentors them. I mean, there is also very a high workload for diverse faculty. That's why you want more of them. So to to reduce the burden. So you can talk about the business case or the education case for diversity, uh, which I think is very solid, especially in education. And you can talk about the legal case. It's the law not to discriminate. And you can talk about, I think, the basic case, the moral case, right? It's just the right thing to do, not to discriminate people based on prejudice and biases. No, thank you. Thank you for this. And I'm comfortable sharing my, my own views. I'm sold on diversity myself. My understanding is that it's good for the soil, it's good for the gut, it's good for the brain, it's good, <laughs> it's good for any kind of, uh, of system you look at. Um, and and bring in other variables like even you know personalities. When I you know when I set up a lab, I like to have different personality styles. Some more structured people, some more kind of all over the place people. But the question of the question of causality still remains. And and this is there's as you know a lot of debate on this. Is um, the absence of uh, absolute diversity or div is the absence of diversity always evidence of oppression or or discrimination? Uh, in other words. Some people have made the argument that in societies that are relatively free, people will tend to congregate towards the kinds of professions uh, that match their interest. And then for very multi-causal complicated reasons that we can never fully comprehend, historically, some, some, some communities, some, some groups have converged towards certain professions. And, is, and, and the ethical question is, is that always a bad thing? Um, should we aim absolutely to have, you know, symmetrical represent, you know, uh, diversity in, in every workplace? And it seems some of the first questions were, we're getting to that with some examples of, you know, for example, uh, Soviet Russia or, or other, uh, other very authoritarian systems that tried to implement a kind of diversity, and, and that also seems to have backfired. So just before we move on to the next really interesting questions, I wonder if you could um, just speak to that briefly. Is absence of diversity always evidence of discrimination? Uh, never say never, never say always. Always never. Uh, sure, I'm, I, I don't want to talk about uh, some, such general rules. Uh, but again, if, you know, it's a, a similar question with feminism. So, you know, li the liberal feminism is okay. So now, women, you have your freedom to go and work and be slave to capitalism, right? Is feminism about having all women work like men and uh, and look like men? And uh, yeah, people would need to be free to do whatever they want. And some in some places, at some period, um, some groups can choose to congregate around some occupations, which is totally fine. That's not a question. The question is, are your systems biased? Are uh, former processes have unintended consequences uh, related to different groups? Now, it doesn't mean that any specific manager or faculty member, whatever, is biased. It means that history was biased, right? And our organizational structures embed that history. Uh, and, and, uh, and also uh, are interacting with so social reality outside the organization that is also biased, right? So this is why you will not have the a, a semi-equal um, share of um, students from each group in, 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 at Harvard where you want to uh, recruit from, right? But then you can see, wait, can I recruit a brilliant, creative, productive professor from Howard, not Harvard, right? Howard is the historic black college. Sure, so sure. sometimes, um, yeah. Thank you. There are so many, the questions are popping up now and all of them are so great. So I apologize in advance if we can't get uh, to, uh, to all the questions. Uh, I'll return to more sort of minute methodological questions here. I thought that was an interesting question about the dependent variable in a lot of your slides was percent, uh, percent change in share of managers from groups. So what is the longitudinal uh, time frame for that? Uh, the question was, what, what is the period of time in which the change occurs? 
So we looked, the data covers the period of 1971 to 2015. Obviously, some of the research was retrospective. Uh, I wasn't researching anything in 1971. Uh, but the, the, we, we, got, we have government data on these companies from 71 to 2015. Uh, about their workforce composition and all the categories that I mentioned. So, so this is very, very unique. And then we did a retrospective survey with more than 800 of the organization for which we have government data, asking them about the uh, diversity management, HR policies, unions, you name it, we asked them. Uh, and, uh, and, and then we created these life histories of, uh, of, for each company, the, the way their structures changed, their HR structures, work structures, etc., and the way the workforce has changed over time. Um, we articulated and collaborated this with other information that we have about history of, of these pro procedures to know that they, the, the data are um, accurate. And basically, we created a longitudinal fixed effects analysis that examines what happens before and after adoption of a program, controlling, you know, with a multivariate analysis, controlling for all other correct, relevant characteristics, also from auxiliary uh, sources. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there were there were several comments. Uh, a lot of people seem to have appreciated your, your recurring finding that something that works really well is improving work conditions and the work the work life balance. Uh, so that's that's really interesting. Um, so just to clarify, is it possible to conclude that relatively colorblind approaches that target the work-life balance and workplace conditions uh, will be more effective than any other more sort of you know racialized or gendered EDI uh, kinds of initiatives? If that's the case, based on what you know from the literature. Uh, what is the ideal workplace conditions that you could recommend for a university or for any organization for that matter? What would you want to see put in place? Wow. So again, these are um, there are principles. I, I cannot talk about a list of specific programs. Uh, we would want to see a we, we would want to see that a career systems are open to everyone or and, and or career supports like work-life supports that everyone can get them i want to ask, answer specifically about your question about universal like colorblind work-life supports because um for it's a very good question and i'm happy that you ask it so because uh for a tenure clock extensions which uh um, relatively common uh, work-life support that the universities uh, grant women as a way to uh, compensate them for the time that was lost for, for having kids in the tenure clock, uh, in the tenure clock period. Uh, the, the, the common belief is that we want to give tenure clock extension only to women, because if a man gets a tenure clock extension for a newborn, they will use the time to be more productive because uh, his wife is taking care of the kids. So basically feminists, uh, some feminists say, if we do a colorblind, a gender blind policy, universal policy, we take the same inequalities and just move them up. But the same inequalities remain. Uh, what we find is actually that universal colorblind or gender blind um, tenure clock extensions as a work-life support are more effective in uh, increasing the share of women and especially non-white women among tenured faculty. Why is that? It's true that some men may take the opportunity to you know, increase their productivity while their wife is taking care of the newborn. However, when policies are universal, they have more legitimacy. They don't have this unintended effect of uh, further stigmatizing women as needing help, needing support, not committed enough, needed to take another year. Um, as, so some universal programs, I mean, universal programs can be very effective uh, in, the, in the sense that they don't uh, reinforce group boundaries, gender ratio, whatever, uh, and they create more legitimacy. Think about mentoring. If I have a mentoring program that is only for women and minorities, they can be perceived as getting uh, a favorable conditions. Why do they get this special mentoring? If I have a mentoring program that is open for everyone, then, but, but we make sure that everyone gets a mentor, 
then it closes that gap because uh, in informal mentoring, uh, women and minorities don't get a mentor. And that's why a departmental mentoring program is, is very effective because it's also much easier to uh, to make sure everybody gets a mentor when the when the when the program is managed by the department rather than the university. <clears throat> so, in an ideal an ideal university has to or, or organization has to undergo this very painful, very painful process of understanding what in our merit and career systems is in fact biased and blind and has blind spots spots to certain groups. Thank you for this answer. And yes, I was very interested in your recommendations about mentoring, which from my limited understanding is something that works well in, in a lot of contexts. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't sure I understood uh, what you said about how um, sort of community matched the mentoring would be. Again, in the field of mental health, we have a similar debate with so-called ethnic matching. Of, of matching clients or patients with, with a clinician from the same group as them. And there are pros and cons to that. Sometimes it works really well. It helps someone feel safer and open up. And sometimes it can also backfire because there is a perception that say, if a community is too closely knit, the person will not feel safe opening up. Um, so are, are the mentorship programs uh, that, that you have in mind or that you know work uh, match people based on, is it based on interest? Is it based on groups? Do you match women with women necessarily? Or if a woman wants, wants a male mentor, that's fine too. The recommended okay. matching is um, on in, based on interest. So mentoring can give you two functions, generally, two functions. One is emotional, and second is, let's call it functional, professional, okay? So emotional support you can get uh, by peer mentoring, uh, or using a, a resource group or networks, affinity groups, they have different names. So you can have, you know, um, black women professors group and they have lunch and they get emotional support. For actually the functional, the career professional benefits of mentoring, you want to match by interest. That's mm -hmm. how first you create the most effective. Second, you create the best buy-in from the mentor because the mentor is interested and because the mentor knows how to help. Uh, and third, you avoid the situation where you have uh, um, the very few non-white potential mentors mentoring a group of, you know, non-white mentees. Because, you know, if you have one black man in the department and they have three mentees, that's a problem. There is research showing that women do better. Uh, they get more work-life supports, for example, when they have a man male mentor, because that male mentor is also more connected. They can sponsor, they can help. They, they're not weak. You want to have a strong mentor. Uh, so yes, matching by interest and not by a identity. Excellent. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back, if I may, to a methodological question, which can also help us revisit the broader philosophical questions about what we mean by diversity. Uh, uh, there's a question asking if there might be a bias, uh, uh, sort of a, in, in at least the research that you're presenting, in that most of the, again, the outcome variable is, is just managers, right? People who reach managerial positions. And the question was, um, is the research entirely based on the presumption that everyone wants to achieve leadership positions? So again, is, is diversity only at, at, at the managerial level really important? So, so methodologically, A, have you looked at or are you aware of data also of what happens below, not necessarily at managerial positions? If you could, if you could uh, yeah, yeah, speak, speak to that, to this idea. And, and, and again, is there, is there a potential, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to frame it, of sort of an elitist bias or, or a bias where perhaps, um, I believe the person asking the question was asking if, if perhaps there are other personality factors, say overachievers, perfectionism, above and beyond, uh, again, the ethno-cultural uh, categories. So why look at managers only? Mm. So th these are separate questions, but yes, there is, um, th there are many reasons to look at managers. Uh, managers, management jobs are the good jobs, both uh, in terms of the uh, financially, so they help uh, people or move, uh, support their family better and, and move to a higher class, and provide better to their kids' education and so forth. So these are good jobs. 
that uh, provide good work-life balance and good health outcomes and so forth. So you want diversity in the good jobs. You want diversity in, the, in these jobs also because these are leadership jobs that not necessarily uh, always, but uh, leadership jobs that will allow the diverse incumbents to also have trickle down uh, policies that can improve further diversity. Again, not every woman that get in, gets into management has to now create a revolution, but on average, women and people of color promote more diversity programs than a, a, a non, a men and non-white men, let's say. They're more supporters, supporters of diversity programs. Um, so, so leaders might also change the organization. You're right that there is an elitist, elitist bias because some people just don't want to be managers and don't want to put all these hours and commitment for the uh, in capitalism and just want to have a decent work. Again, we can, and that's so true. Again, we can assume that the workplace will look more decent when management is more diverse. That's one thing. Second, we do look at um, professional jobs and the patterns are more or less the same. So these are also good jobs, but not management jobs like uh, nurses, for example. Uh, and the patterns are more or less the same. Uh, third, some of the jobs that some of the bad jobs are already most of the bad jobs are already diverse. So if you want to look at uh, uh, technicians or uh, unskilled labor and so forth, so 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 forth. So it's a little bit more difficult with this kind of research to dissect what diversity means in non-good jobs. It, I'm sure it has a meaning in terms of the microaggressions and the work conditions and so forth. Now, for the other question about the, you know, the individual fixed effects, the, uh, you know, some people are just like, but they're better than others, regardless of their race and gender and everything. Yes, this is a, an organizational analysis. The unit of analysis is the organization. Uh, if we see we can assume that the distribution of some internal managerial abilities is, is normal in, in society. Um, we, can, we can assume that it would be the same before and after adoption of diversity training, targeted recruitment, mentoring, whatever. So there, it shouldn't interfere in our results. That distribution shouldn't change because of a program adoption. To the contrary, it should help people with managerial aspirations that were not able to get there before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So there, there, there are tons of questions going back to this ultimately unanswerable question of, of what is diversity. Um, but there, there was another question about, you know, whether you'd consider diversity of thought. We, we, we talked about it a, a little bit, but I'd like to maybe summarize some of these questions about, you know, what do you put in the construct of diversity? In, in two ways. First, by asking you if you may again recap in your in your ideal study in your ideal workplace, what are the key variables beyond beyond race and gender that you would put in uh, to properly capture how much diversity there is and, and there perhaps ought to be uh, in, in in a workplace. So that's the first part of the question. If you could just list off some variables that you think are very relevant, right? So some people have mentioned diversity of of, of opinions. Um, and, and here we've been looking mostly at the available data on, on ethno-racial categories. And the second part of the question, and several people hinted at that, is are there examples where diversity backfires or, where, or is there a threshold where too much diversity becomes counterproductive? And I'm thinking here of, again, you know, complexity to me is a good metaphor for, for diversity and for why diversity is good. Um, However, we also know that the average human mind is not very good at handling complexity, which is why we invite people to consider nuance, to consider different kinds of opinions. But in trying to understand also why so many people and so many organizations might be reluctant to too much diversity. So I wonder if you've, you've thought about that. Are there just deleterious effects of too much diversity? But first, tell us a little bit more about what you would put in your diversity construct. Again, I... Um, I, I, in this sense, I wish it was like a more a workshop kind of like roundtable conversation because I am curious about. Um, I, I don't see diversity this way. For me, diversity is again it's first non it's just non discrimination. Just bring in people uh, because of their merit and 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 really look very carefully, very painfully, at the blind parts of your processes. 
the blind spots uh, uh, and, and in, in, at the, at, in universities is especially difficult for us faculty because we are scientists and we think that our criteria of merit are of course not biased, they're scientific, they're objective. Uh, if we look historically, we'll see that yes, they are. I mean, even with the, I'm, I'm, I'm a sociologist, within sociology, you know, we have qualitative and quantitative, we have interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary differences, and each of these subdisciplines have criteria of, of merit. And uh, if we deconstruct that, we'll see that some of them uh, put some groups can be with different political opinions different religious group, whatever, they put some groups out of the game. So once we open the game, we'll get diversity of opinions, of groups, of ages, of everything. Ages in academia is also problematic, right? Uh, we see grant, uh, grant, uh, grant uh, foundations that give grants to uh, uh, researchers, in early career researchers, the age of 40. What, like, Mothers are out when you say that, right? Okay, uh, so so I, I think d demographically we're talking about um, in companies age diversity, uh, all the ethno ethno racial diversity, gender diversity, LGBT, ableism, uh, weight, uh, uh, beauty. I mean, you can talk height. You can talk about everything. Uh, it's more about just uh, have these open processes, make sure everybody has a mentor, everybody gets their work life support and so forth and so forth. Just uh, your career. By the way, for example, universities tend to hire more whites and more white, more white men during um, economic crisis. So the big recession. Sorry. Yeah, you, you have a paper on that. Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, okay, so you see, so so you know that that this is not diversity. That when uh, a, when you're stressed, you go, you you stay, you, you keep your friends close. Uh, that's not so. So diversity is for me non discrimination. Uh, too much diversity. Again, uh, can you say I'm I'm implying the same logic? Can you say there is too much fairness? I'm too much just making sure I'm bringing in merit. There might be too much. Yeah, I mean, uh, you want to go slow, you want to make sure everybody or almost everybody's on board, there might be too much obsession with diversity in the sense that uh, you're losing people. Uh, and if you're losing people, it's not good because they might be uh, microaggressions that you, they might not want to be mentors and so forth. So ideally, you want the boat, most of the boat to keep moving together, most of the people to, you, you can never get everyone on board. But there, by definition, there couldn't be too much diversity uh, because uh, research shows that, uh, by the way, that in this, uh, in the short period, in you know, small group research, I'm sure you know it. In in the short period, uh, diversity can create tension, which makes sense. I'm in Israel. If I have to sit now in the, with an Arab person in the room, I don't know how to talk with them without offending them, without that they will understand. I don't know. I mean, I do, but I, I, as if I, uh, so it creates tension in the short term, but in the long term, again, that small group research shows that uh, diverse groups actually do have um, significant productivity advantages. No, thank you so much. And I'm sure that if we define diversity as non-discrimination, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain I can speak on almost everyone's behalf here that we, we all agree that diversity is good. It just remains that uh, it's it's really ethically difficult to distinguish the, the, the correct criteria for discrimination. So wrongful discrimination is what we don't want. Wrongful discrimination is uh, isolating an irrelevant criteria for the special treatment of a person. Because once we do that, so of course there are grievances, there are people who find that some instances of positive discrimination for some groups are interpreted as negative as uh, discrimination for others. So it, it, it's complicated, but I mean, you you very eloquently answered the question. Um, I wanted to go back to another mythological and still kind of philosophical questions. Um, so one, one person asks, um, says, we hear a lot that uh, women and minorities in particular tend to work harder uh, uh, for less recognition uh, in, in, in less progress in the workplace. So the idea was, how are those measured? I, I suppose there are different measures across studies, but is this typically self-report or um, so what is uh, what is the sort of 
how is the construct derived? How is this idea? Um, Excellent question, because, you know, I can say I, I work harder just because, you know, there are personality uh, variables that intervene here, like what is work harder, but there are quality, uh, quantitative studies showing, for example, that uh, white men are promoted earlier uh, with the same performance evaluations, the same productivity, white men are simply promoted earlier. So the other way to look at it is that to get the promotion, non-white men had to mm -hmm. have another year of this performance evaluation, another year of that productivity, for example. So we have quantitative evidence on, the, on productivity and seniority and performance evaluations showing that. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm also mindful of time. I, I, I realize that, you know, the conversation is so fascinating that we're we're going to have to wrap up uh, pretty soon. Um, so I want to I want to thank you and I want to thank the audience as well, with apologies for not having been able to address any questions. Sandra, is there is there a final thought that you want to communicate to the group? Um, I, I want to say about the women working harder, it's non white you, you, in academia, it's very easy to see the CVs of, uh, of men and women or men, whites and non whites that are promoted. It's actually, although in academia, it's it's very difficult to uh, for us to understand that we are also biased, especially in the recruitment stage. Uh, it's also very easy to see bias because because of the because of uh, uh, that our productivity is very very quantified uh, in a sense. Um, yeah, I I can stop here. Uh, the, the, well, very so very good that. questions. I, I could go on, but thank you. I want to yeah. I want to thank the presenter, Dr. Kalev, again for for coming today. Thank the audience, and and I hope the conversation will will continue. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you, and thank you for these questions.